Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see so many of you here. Um, Happy New Year. My name is Grace Chen. I'm the head of investor relations for Capital Land. We're starting 2019 on a very exciting note. Uh, many of you would agree with that. And we can't wait to take you through the details of this transaction. So bringing together Ascenders, Singbridge, and Capital Land will create the largest diversified real estate group in Asia. In our opinion, it is a transaction that will set us up for a transformational growth. This is Capital Land 3.0. So in a few minutes' time, I will invite our president and group CEO, Mr. Lee Chi Kun, to take us through the rationale of this transaction and where it would take capital land. Our group CFO, Mr. Andrew Lim, will then share in greater detail about the portfolio. We will have a Q&A session after both their presentations, which will be joined by the rest of our senior management team. If you're joining us through a webcast, please feel free to send us your questions by clicking the post question tab. And without further ado, I would like to invite Chi Kun, our president and group CEO, to take the stage. Chi Kun, please. Hi, uh, good morning. Thank you for coming at uh, sh such a short notice. Obviously, we can't uh, get everybody to, to uh, to inform you any earlier than, than we could or we wanted. Uh, today's announcement um, it's, uh, marks a very important milestone for Capital Land's uh, transformational journey. Uh, we have, of course, been uh, discussing and uh, deliberating on this deal for some time. Uh, quite glad that we managed to reach a, a landing. Uh, over the weekend, uh, after very intensive uh, uh, a few months of uh, structuring the deal for one that would uh, make sense for both uh, for for Capital Land, for the shareholders, for the company, and uh, to create a more exciting uh, future. Strategically, uh, this deal uh, makes uh, uh, sense for Capital Land for the following few reasons. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it adds. Uh, interesting asset classes, uh, especially in the new economy sectors driven by technology, driven uh, uh, by technology e-commerce growth in areas relating to logistics, to business parks, to data center, to industrial. Uh, and we'll add on to the uh, um, portfolio of uh, uh, asset classes that Capital is traditionally strong at, residential, shopping mall offices. I think with the whole range of uh, asset classes, it gives us more uh, choice to deploy capital. We can decide on uh, how to deploy uh, capital on which asset classes depending on the property cycle. The second strategic rationale is uh, that it really, this uh, particular combination with uh, Sanders Singh Bridge give us a more broader geographical spread. I mean, if you look at Capital Land uh, today, even though we are global, our exposure is mainly in Singapore and China. Uh, this particular transaction will give us meaningful scale in key growth markets like India, which um, brings a lot of uh, promise and uh, excitement. And the sectors that uh, uh, Ascender Singh Bridge is in, in the industrial and logistics and business park, is one that's growing and doing very, very well. Uh, kudos to the team um, and uh, Europe and also in the US. And again, if you look at it from Capital Land's perspective, it gives us a, uh, a, a bigger uh, options to deploy capital more globally for us to decide how to deploy capital between the developed markets and the emerging markets. Okay. And third point is that uh, it also helps to add business to our core markets, especially in Singapore and in China. Uh, there's a lot of synergy in the uh, uh, business capabilities in these two areas where we can unlock both in terms of capabilities, in terms of asset classes. And I think that that will continue to help to drive the income for the group. And uh, the fourth, and I would say the, the one of the most important reasons behind this is you actually uh, create the largest, I would say the fund manager in Asia, 116 billion uh, AUM, and now if you put on put us on a global scale, we will rank about top ten. With the scale, the market options globally, 
the different range of uh, asset classes, it really, really positioned capital land strongly to compete on a global scale in the fund management space. And I think this brings tremendous promise to capital land. Okay? So, uh, so that's roughly the, the, the broad rationale for the deal. I just go a bit more into the financials. So the whole deal, it's about uh, 11 billion, okay? Uh, 6 billion is the consideration, out of which uh, $3 billion is uh, debt funded, $3 billion is uh, 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 equity that is uh, essentially uh, paid to the vendor. The consideration mix is done after you know, extensive evaluation of our uh, balance sheet. It is a uh, debt that we are taking on is something that we are comfortable. Uh, gearing post transaction will be slightly above 0 0.7, and uh, we are comfortable with that and still give us capacity to invest, to especially to give us that growth capital to support the various activities that we are trying to do. Of course, if you uh, couple that with the uh, very disciplined and active recycling uh, activities that the company has been doing over the last few years, I think that will continue to help to drive our returns on a sustainable basis above our cost of equity. In terms of the 50% uh, equity, um, that's being issued at a premium to spot about 7 over percent. If you look at whether it's one month or three month VWAP, it's more than 11%. Uh, that's the, the, the level of uh, shares. And the whole deal is constructed such that we are not uh, expecting any shareholder to cough up any capital. And the company does not expect that there will be any changes to the dividend policy meaning that the dividends that the other shareholders will not be affected by this transaction. Okay, so that's roughly the financial construct. Of course, because we are issuing shares at below NAV, there's some level of dilution, but we look at the entire portfolio that we are acquiring, $6 billion that we are paying. If you break down the $6 billion, really it's the assets, which we are paying at book value. Okay, book value, meaning that is whether it's the assets on the development pipeline and also the assets that are operational, we are paying book value. The listed REITs units, we are paying market price, but we pay a multiple in terms of the fund management platform. And the multiple that we pay for the platform will essentially give us that uh, scale in terms of the fund management platform to really become a global uh, player in this space which I think will really help to position the company for the future. I understand that uh, some of uh, the investors may be concerned that after this transaction capital land will be even more complex. I would uh, like to maybe present you in a different perspective. If you look at capital land, really there are three key earnings drivers. One is development, one is the fund management type of the business, and the third limb is really about lodging, which is the escort side of the business. So if you look at the development business, uh, we have articulated that we want to focus in terms of development. We have been buying up residential pipeline in Singapore in a very disciplined manner. China replenishing. And this particular transaction would add to the pipeline, development pipeline in our core markets and also markets in India. So that's one stream of income. In terms of the fund management side of the business, uh, later Andrew will give you a bit more details. It will essentially increase our fee income by 40% uh, from the fund management. And the range of the different assets, again, the different market will give you uh, possibilities to, s to create new funds to form new REITs and to drive earnings and ROE for the company. The third limb of the business is really about the escort I mentioned earlier. This business is very global in nature, uh, one that we can scale and uh, we are going to organize it quite independently and at some point in time, 
if it goes to a certain level of scale, it's not ready, we may consider uh, liquidity options, even the possibility of uh, spinning it off. But it's still too early, we have not made any decision, but this is a possible consideration down the road, depending on how the growth, how, how we envisage the growth of the, uh, of the, of the lodging platform. So that's really a, a broad summary of uh, what I wanted to explain about the, the transaction. But as in all major transactions of this nature, the success of uh, the transaction would really be about integration. Are we able to integrate the business together? Are we able to integrate the people, the culture, so that we can really unlock the synergy the values under underlying the, the portfolio and to continue to drive uh, uh, good returns on a sustainable basis for the combined entity. And we are quite confident. I mean, the, we have spent quite a lot of time with the management team on the uh, Ascender Singbridge site. I uh, really want to uh, uh, take this chance to really commend uh, Miguel and his team for running uh, Ascender Singbridge very well, highly profitable, and build new capabilities in new asset classes, uh, new geographies, and that's why uh, I'm confident that if we were to put the two teams together, the two sets of uh, portfolio capabilities it will position Capital Land for a much stronger future. So that's all I have. I'll leave Andrew to give you all the, the details behind the, the deal, and then before we take the Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Chikun, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. And the uh, course of the last uh, couple of years, I think many of you who I've met on our investor roadshows and our, our deal road, non-deal roadshows often complain that, uh, that there's nothing to write about for Capital Land. Give us a story. So we hope with this announcement today, we, we have done so. So thank you for coming. And in the next couple of, uh, in the next half an hour or so, I'll walk you through uh, two elements of the transaction. One, what we see in Ascender Singbridge and that really attracts us to this business, this platform. And secondly, on the other side of the coin, what it will do to Capital Land and what will Capital Land 3.0 look like. So this slide, to speak to some of Chikun's points or quantify some of Chikun's points, talks about how we want to transform capital land into the next phase of growth. And the key word here is growth. I think in order to do that, we've identified a couple of mega trends that we think are very important. And these are things like urbanization, e-commerce, and so on and so forth. So we, want, we wanted to identify a sector or a business that would allow us to pivot into and capture these mega trends, because this is what is going to drive growth going forward in real estate. Going to three o'clock, you all are very aware of our core markets, our, our, our growth markets. So we, as part of any consideration on acquiring or combining with a new business, we wanted to ensure that we are able to deepen and strengthen our presence in both our core markets and our growth markets. And I'll give you a sense of how we've been able to do that or will be able to do that. Going to nine o'clock, this is very important from a returns and a growth perspective. Any combination, any consideration for a new business acquisition must take into account our ability to grow profitably and also our ability to grow return on equity to our shareholders. You've also talked about an importance of recurring income. And again, as we will demonstrate, we believe that the Ascender Singbridge business brings with it a very stable, very secure source of recurring income that will combine into Capital Land's own stability and recurring income stream. We've also reorganized the business, as Chi Kun talked about. I'll spend a bit of time on that. But none of these things happen without the talent that must come with the business. And so 
combining the skills and the complementarity of what Ascender Singbridge brings into the Capital Land platform, I think gives us the ability to attract the best in class talent as we take Capital Land into 3.0. So let's talk about the first bit, which is why Ascender Singbridge? If you pull out to 10,000 feet, this gives you a snapshot of what the ASB business looks like. And I want to give you a sense of three things that we find very interesting to us. Number one is obviously the fund management platform. So you see three listed REITs. One of them is the largest in Singapore. The other one is the only listed REIT that gives you exposure into the Indian business space market. And obviously we have a very strong Ascenders Hospitality Trust platform that complements what Ascot Residence Trust is able to offer to investors as well. Number two, if you focus on the right-hand side of the chart, you see that the bulk of the Ascenders platform is in the new economy space, allowing us to pivot into these mega trends that I spoke about. And number three, if you focus on the left-hand side, where you see that business is concentrated from a geographic standpoint, you see again that they have the bulk of their business in Capital Land's core markets, which allows us to dovetail our platform onto theirs. They bring with them a very exciting new growth market in India, a market that you will know we have had trouble unlocking before, despite some very strong attempts. And they have a very strong rest of the world platform, namely in the developed markets in the US, as well as the UK and Australia. So pull up and you see, again, three very strong attributes that I will again spend a bit more time touching on. Number one, Ascendus is Asia's leading business space and urbanization solutions provider. Again, the exposure to the mega trends that I talked about are one of the key attributes. If you, if you drill down into the AUM, that underpins Ascenders, you'll see that more than 80% of their AUM is in business spaces. More than 50% of the AUM are in the very sectors that are exposed to the new economy, business parks, logistics, and data centers. Here you see examples of the, these assets uh, across the Ascenders Simbridge platform. Logistics facilities in India, campus-style business parks in Science Park, Singapore, suburban offices in the US. Equally important, we are looking at a full value chain in these new economy sectors. A developer, owner, operator, and fund manager with Ascenders REIT and Ascenders India Trust as the offtake platforms. This model should look very familiar to those of you who are familiar with Capital Land because it's exactly what we seek to do in our existing sectors of retail, uh, office, and hospitality or lodging. So this brings a high degree of complementarity and confidence that we are combining with a platform in the new economy that is very similar to our own. Now, a key capability that ASB possesses is that they are a leading urbanization solutions provider. And again, this goes back to a mega trend that we have all read about, this urbanization globally. You will know that as the uh, urbanization platform in Ascender Singbridge combines the uh, sorry Ascender Singbridge combines the Singbridge business that was merged into Ascenders back in 2015. They now uh, refer to this as the Sustainable Urban Development Division or SUD for short. Now there are very good examples of such projects. We have the Guangzhou Knowledge City, we have the uh, Tech Park in Gagawan, India, and we have Science Park here in Singapore. What is very attractive to us is that we are acquiring a very large land bank of more than 18 million square feet of developable land bank in our core markets of Singapore and China. This is a profitable business. Singbridge business or the SUD business contributed 165 million to the ASB profit as of the last 12 months ending September 2018. So it is a large scale and profitable platform. And finally, we have invested in commercially driven projects, or ASB has rather, with strong local partners. So this is a story about acquiring embedded NAV growth. These are projects that are invested in at the early stage where you acquire land at good prices, you develop using your core skill set, you harvest 
for sale or for operations, and you do that over and over again. These are large scale. They've demonstrated an ability to do this profitably, and this is a, a skill set that we are very excited about. I won't spend too much time on this slide because I think this one speaks for itself. 66% of the AUM in Ascenda Singbridge is in fund management. We will inherit three listed platforms and seven private funds to complement our existing REIT and fund business. Second point is on the financial strength of Ascenda Singbridge. Here we've set out a few of these key metrics on a, to show you that on a trajectory level, particularly in PADME and in ROE and in AUM, their trajectory very much resembles Capital Land's trajectory. If you look at the ROE at 10.2%, again, this is something that we are striving towards. So we think that by combining the two platforms, the two businesses, we dovetail two very similar businesses in terms of the trajectory of profitability and ROE growth. You get growth of income, as you can see from this slide, but equally important, you require quality of income, and I'll touch on that in a little, in a little while. The third point I'd like to make about Ascender Singbridge is that it's highly complementary to Capital Land. In this slide, what we have done is we've looked at the key Ascender's businesses and we've grouped them into existing asset classes and new asset classes. So in the existing asset classes, they complement our presence in the existing markets, a core CBD office in Singapore and China. They complement our existing US presence through the suburban office portfolio. And they have a global hospitality platform through Ascenders Hospitality Trust. They bring a new core CBD office presence into Korea, which is a market that we, have, we are currently not in. And that's the left-hand side. Turn to the right-hand side. These are new asset classes, namely logistics, business parks, industrials, the new economy businesses. Throughout our core and growth markets and adding that new India market for us, you see the complementarity of what Ascenders uh, Singbridge does to the CL platform. It deepens our footprint in our core markets by adding 21% AUM, and it adds an attractive new economy sector by adding 13% AUM on a pro forma basis. The commercial platform is another way that we believe Ascenders Singbridge is highly complementary. Currently, Capital Land is present in seven countries, mainly in the CBD core. What Ascenders brings is additional three countries and a diversification into the suburban office market. So this will grow our commercial exposure by 19% on an AUM basis. In addition to deepening the commercial platform, we allow ourselves to diversify into complementary subsectors, as I mentioned earlier. Here we are at CBD office. Ascenders brings us presence in suburban and business parks. The other level of complementarity is in the platforms. We have an Office of the Future platform that we are growing very uh, um, enthusiastically at Capital Land. Ascenders has a similar platform. They've, they call them the Flexible Workplace solu uh, Solutions Provider. And this will bring us that capability to develop subjects, uh, topics like co-working, flexible workspace into the entire office ecosystem. So that is, I think, in a nutshell, hopefully summarizes why we believe Ascender Singbridge is the right fit for Capital Land. The next section summarizes what Capital Land 3.0 will look like. Here's that same slide again from before, and now we pull again, we pull back out and we look at the overlay and the transposition of the Ascender Singbridge business in green and Capital Land's existing business in blue. Now, what again, what I want to leave with you is I believe that this adds tremendous balance and diversification to Capital Land. I'll give you some examples. If you look at the sector mix, previously retail comprised about 36% of Capital Land's AUM. That trims down to 32%. Lodging and commercial remain 
key business pillars, 20-26% respectively, they, they slightly come down. And we have an exciting new vertical in logistics and industrial comprising 13% of AUM. That's on the sector basis. If you look at the country basis, what has happened is that our Singapore exposure has increased from 30 to 33% by AUM basis, and our China exposure trims down from 48 to 41%. So despite adding a new India business, 3%, the DMEM mix, again on an AUM basis, I think the balance improves. Before we are 42.58 on an AUM basis, pro forma we are at 48.52, demonstrating better EM DM balance. Okay, so again, I want to take this away. I want you to take away that Asia's largest diversified group is not just a sexy title. Okay, we truly believe we get better balance and diversification both on a sector basis and a country basis from this combination. There'll be four subsections here, and each of these are directly linked to Capital N 3.0 and how we want to pivot into that model. The first of these is the potential to accelerate growth in ROE and NAV. We see multiple growth drivers for Capital N going forward. Starting from left to right, these are familiar to you. We've talked about our fund man management platform. We are adding we will have 67 billion in AUM and we will grow our fees revenue about 40% to 337 million on a pro forma basis with underpinned by 31 REITs and private funds. This gives you growth in AUM and recurring income. Secondly, development pipeline, again, very important part of our business. This is our trading business. We estimate about 11.5 billion in development book value to allow us to grow the development pipeline in our key markets where we have a development business. Number three, our investment properties and our operating platforms. We will have 44.9 billion of investment properties across all of our sectors. And this is excluding what AREIT and um, AIT have because we don't, as Senator Singh does not consolidate them. But this gives you growth in recurring income from our IP and gives us lots of options when we look at how we are going to reconstitute or continue to reconstitute the portfolio. And last but certainly not least, the new economy growth sectors that we will have as a result of the combination with Ascendus incrementally adds 12.4 billion in AUM, which gives us growth in an exciting new economy vertical. So we add up these four growth drivers. We are very, very excited by the potential to drive ROE and NAV going forward in 3.0. The next two slides talks you through the core markets as well as the growth markets. In our core market of Singapore, our existing presence you can see is centered around the central core as well as the CBD in our retail as well as our office portfolio. What Ascender Singbridge brings is very good coverage of the East, the North and the West, principally through AREIT's ownership of logistics and business park assets. We add over 200% in GFA, over th about 30% in land bank for development as well as rejuvenation, and 40% in AUM growth. In China, we are focused on our five city clusters, and that will not change because the Sender Singh Bridges China exposure is similarly concentrated in these five clusters. So from a core market perspective, which is something that's very important to us, what Ascender Singh Bridge brings is an ability to deepen the presence in both of these markets. And we have identified three growth markets and regions to complement our core market presence. Number one, it's very exciting new growth market of India. Obviously, this is all Ascenders. They have a presence that is concentrated in the business parks, but they have already started to grow their logistics business or logistics presence. And that is an area where we believe has tremendous growth because in India, Ascenders is a first mover and they have a great advantage. As we I mentioned earlier, they also have the benefit of a full chain business platform that starts from development all the way down 
to AIT. And so they have an ability to recycle capital from development to monetizing mature and operating assets. Vietnam will remain a key business for us, a key growth market. We have already an existing presence across our sectors. What we are able to do now is to bolt on that key new sector of logistics and business parks. Ascenders has one in Saigon. And finally, in the US and Europe, where we have a strong developed markets exposure in investment properties, Ascenders brings with it a, a, a one billion uh, suburban office portfolio to complement our multi-family portfolio there. They also have, through a re good presence in the UK, through the business parks. So again, I think want to leave with you the core market deepening as well as an attractive exposure through our growth markets of India, Vietnam, and the, the US, uh, Europe developed market axis. As Chikun mentioned, Capital Land will be Asia's largest real estate investment manager. We will meet our target of 100 billion AUM that we set for ourselves, hopefully substantially ahead of time. We will leapfrog from our current position, number 14, to number 9, which will put us in league with some very established fund manager, investment manager names, and allow us to complete, compete globally for blue chip capital partners and funding. REITs and fund management fees will grow about 40% pro forma. We will have the honor of sponsoring the four largest S REITs in these key sectors of hospitality, commercial, retail, and logistics. And we will be able to call on eight REITs and 23 private funds as offtake vehicles as we search for capital partners. So here we have a growth of recurring income and scale to grow our fund management business. I mentioned earlier that with growth in income, equally important is to retain the quality of that income. And what we'd like to set out for you here is that on a combined basis, okay, this is our PADME, as of LTM 2018, uh, September, we combine Ascender Singh Bridges PADME, we have about 2 billion in PADME. But there is no degradation in operating PADME, and there is no degradation in cash PADME we are able to retain the high quality recurring income nature of our business. This is very important because we, it allows us to sustain our dividend policy and it allows us to think and implement a disciplined deleveraging strategy as we get our gearing back down to a sustainable level. We've organized ourselves slightly differently and again, Chikun touched on this to better allow us to pivot into 3.0. Now, the reason we have organized Singapore and international and China along geographical terms is that if you look at the sectors that these underpin, residential, the retail, and commercial, they are very tightly entwined, requiring local presence and on-the-ground knowledge. If you look at our Raffles City product, that is a great example of why these things have to be tightly meshed together. And so we have organized these two markets, oh sorry, these two business units by market. And Chikun talked about lodging being high growth and a global business for us. So we've wanted to keep them independent and able to drive this growth semi-autonomously. Similarly, the logistics, industrials, and business park sector, because of its unique nature, will fold in under a separate BU for capital land. And last but not least, a wish that many of you has, have expressed, we will begin to separately report our asset management business fee income. So underpinning all of this are sec centers of excellence. We talked about what Ascender Singbridge brings in terms of digital platforms, office of the future, and data analytics. Okay, we will obviously continue to focus and have centers of excellence for our existing verticals, retail and lodging. The focus on future proofing and business innovation remains undiminished. So again, some examples here of complementary platforms that Ascenders brings, both in apps as well as Office of the Future flexible workspace solutions. These will dovetail very, very neatly 
onto the Capital M platform. And again, perhaps the most important and hardest to quantify is the human capital. We want to be able to develop the best in class talent pool, which will be a function of mobility, culture, and talent development. We want Capital Land to remain an employer of choice in Singapore and, and globally. Sorry. So I think I'm a bit too eager to finish. Here are some pro forma financial highlights. So what we've done here is we have updated the numbers on a pro forma basis uh, to 30th September for both businesses, give you better flavor of what the pro forma combination will do financially. As Chikun mentioned, this is immediately EPS accretive, immediately ROE accretive, two metrics that are very important to us and our shareholders. There will be a slight NAV dilution, uh, which is a mathematical output. But we believe, and I hope I have demonstrated to you, that this is a business that holds tremendous potential for NAV growth. And so we would ask shareholders to come with us on my, uh, moderate NAV dilution as we drive growth through the platforms. These numbers will change when the circular comes out because we will be updating financials by three months or so. But I think it's important to remember directionally, we don't expect these numbers to move. Our credit metrics, whilst higher, I believe remain robust. Net debt to equity will, imp will rise from 0.51 as of 30th September to 0.72. Uh, this is further updated for investments that we have made in the fourth quarter. So you'll see in a footnote, we have added the debt in for some of these assets, including the multifamily portfolio, our investment in Pearl Bank, the mixed development in Seng Kang, and H55 in Shanghai, which was done through one of our funds. So this pro forma debt to equity number takes into account what we the large investments that we made in Q4 plus the acquisition of Ascender Singh Bridge combination, I should say. Net debt to equity, again, rises, but we believe that this is uh, in line with some of our peers and remains robust. If I look at the maturity profile, so what we have done here is we've just added the acquisition debt of three billion plus. Now this we will look to term out so that we can deliver similarly stable and uh, robust debt towers across the platform. The target is such that none of these towers should in be over 20%. Okay, so uh, that will be a focus on for Capital Land and the Treasury team upon closing of the transaction. Uh, we have assumed for now that the 3 billion debt is taken on in 2020. Okay. And last but not least, I think we should acknowledge that this drives our gearing to 0.72. Okay, so there must be in place a very focused deleveraging plan. Yeah, and here are some of the details that I can share with you now. We've talked before about what is the sustainable debt to equity ratio on a run rate basis, and I think I've shared that that's 0.64. So as an immediate plan in the short term, I think step one is to take Capital Land back down to that sustainable level of 0.64. Okay, we estimate that this implies that we have to take a net delivering of about $3 billion. If you think about where this can come from, I think there are sort of three sources that you can rely on in, in the next 18 to 24 months. Number one is the pace of capital recycling. Last year, Capital Land recycled north of $4 billion on gross value terms. Ascenders Singbridge also have their own recycling program. If you bring both of these recycling programs together, that gets you in the neighborhood of four to five billion on a pro forma basis, and our target remains to drive at least three billion annually. That's number one. Number two is operating uh, income growth. We combined with capit uh, combined with the Sanders Singbridge, have about two billion in PADME. If I pay out a sustainable dividend of about six hundred million, based on the last dividend, 
we have 1.2 to 1.4 billion of PADME that will grow the equity base and give us that ability to manage our debt to equity. And last but not least, we have a, a number of securitizable platforms as well as our private equity funds with committed but undrawn capital that will allow us to tap third-party capital in the next 18 to 24 months. So when you combine these three buttons that we can push, I think we are very confident that we can get back down to 0.64 by the end of 2020. That remains our target. Okay, I think it remains for me to just give you a quick summary of the post-combination steps. The most important, I think, the sh in the short term is that we will create an integration committee comprising members of both companies. It's equally important to make sure that the culture, the skills and the capabilities come across and mesh seamlessly with what we have in Capital Land. None of the pro forma financials assume any synergies, and I'm sure that will be a question that some of you will ask. We have ass not assumed any cost synergies because we believe that this combination is about additive revenue growth and additive profit growth. And so in the months ahead, we will identify and see how the two businesses mesh together to allow us to drive ROE, drive NAV, and drive profitability. So I think I'll just end on a note that says that 3.0 is something that we are very, very excited about. It involves the ability to combine effectively with a world-class platform, particularly in new economies. It allow us to bring in best-in-class management to retain that, um, that talent. It will allow us the ability to tap on blue chip capital providers through an enlarged fund management platform. And we will continue to develop very, very strong local partnerships. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, I would now like to invite uh, all uh, the rest of our senior management bench to join us on stage, uh, and we will start the Q&A session shortly. I would like to introduce the rest of our senior management team who have just joined us. Uh, so firstly, uh, starting from the right, we have uh, Mr. Tan Seng Chai, our group chief people officer, and Mr. Lucas Lo, president, China and investment management. And we have Mr. Lee Chi Kun and Mr. Andrew Lim, and followed by Mr. Jason Liao, president, Asia and retail. And lastly, we have Mr. Wun Kai Ming, beside uh, Mr. Jason Liao. And if you would like to uh, ask a questions, please raise your hands and my colleagues on either side of the aisle will pass you the microphone. And for the benefit of uh, everyone in this audience, I would uh, like for you to mention your name and your company. And for people joining us through a live webcast, please uh, join us by uh, sending us your questions by clicking the post question tab. And with that, I would like to uh, open the floor for the first question. Please, Brandon. Hi, um, Brandon from City. Uh, just a couple of questions on the valuation portion. Can you share with us um, the valuation portion? Yeah, can you share with us on the uh, the fee multiple that you're paying for the fund management business for ASB, and does it also include payment for the property management platform? Yeah, that's my first question. My second question would be. Could you sort of explain to us, uh, aside from the valuation paid for the fund management business, um, how did the NAV for ASB grow to six billion from the one point eight billion as of March eighteen? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Brandon. Thanks. Welcome back. Uh, so the blended multiple that we. Um, uh, 
factored into for the fund management business is between 15 to 16 times. Blended multiple it implies it is for both the FM and the PM business. Okay. And your second question around uh, NAV for uh, ASP? Okay. For us, the, the NAV is constructed through, as Chiku mentioned, a uh, number of pillars. So we picked up the IP at 5.3. We value the IP at 5.3 billion. This is on a total basis uh, before we take out that. We have book value of development properties of about 2.5 billion. And then we have the stakes in our listed REITs which are picked up at market. So if you add those three up and you imp compute your multiple for your funds management business, you get to um, the EV enterprise value and then you get to that consideration of six billion for the equity, for the NAV. Thanks. Can we have the next question? David, please. Um, good, good morning, David. I'm from Daiwa. Uh, my question is regarding the process of deleveraging three billion from your balance sheet to get to your target gearing. If you deleverage, wouldn't that be EPS dilutive? And in two to three years, how confident are you that your ROE would actually improve after the deleveraging? Yeah, it's a good question and um, one that I think we will be very focused on. So it's, as I mentioned, it is uh, reasonable to acknowledge that we have made a very sizable acquisition. As a result of that, we've had to increase our gearing as part of that acquisition. I think it's worth men mentioning that we put a lot of thought into the capital structure of the acquisition. We will get, I'm sure, lots of questions around, could you have not issued more shares? Could you have not issued less shares? And so on and so forth. So we have factored all of this into account and we believe that this capital structure, which involves three billion of debt, three billion of shares, is a well-balanced well one and allows us the ability to deliver, but at the same time does not constrict us in terms of continuing to grow the business going forward. Okay, so that's very, very important. Will we make another six billion acquisition in the, in the next 12 months? I doubt it. But at the same time, we are very focused that this must not hamstring us, must not tie our hands in our ability to continue to grow the business. I also talked a lot about the trajectory of the both businesses pre-combination. Both of us are on sort of high single, double digit trajectories in ROE terms. So we are not subsidizing the acquisition of ASB. ASB is not helping us out either in, on this metric. We think by dovetailing the two who are on similar trajectories and you allow the synergies, the revenue synergies that we believe can, will take place, this gives us an excellent shot of maintaining that ROE trajectory whilst we deliver. Hope that answers your question. Hi, good morning. This is Louis from Credit Suisse here. A uh, few questions. I think, firstly, I think Andrew, uh, just now you made mention to synergy. So, just wanted to ask if you can help us to quantify some of these uh, revenue and cost synergies um, <coughs> targets that you might have over the next two years. In terms of uh, uh, cost synergy, I think uh, Andrew alluded to earlier, uh, the whole uh, pro forma was done without uh, taking into consideration any cost synergies because what we are really looking at is uh, uh, combining with uh, Ascender Simbridge, uh, looking at the complementary skill sets, uh, portfolio capabilities. So that's why we did not uh, uh, factor that as a consideration for this particular uh, transaction. If you look at uh, their business, a uh, large part of it is in uh, business space related. In terms of customer synergies uh, for people that look for office space, whether it's in the office or in business park, uh, there are tremendous synergies to be, uh, to be reaped, especially from the, if you look at it from the corporate customer's point of view. 
uh, for customers they are looking for growth especially in Asia in India in China in Vietnam Singapore be in the business park space be in the office space I believe the the two companies would offer a much more interesting option to many of the corporate uh, tenants thank you in another question um, which is somewhat related um, to the proposed uh, spin-off at some point I think you already have quite a sizable uh, lodging business so um, what other kind of yardsticks should we look at before you consider it um, a, a good time for you to undertake this spin-off and at the same time you have um, quite a number of various listed REITs um, so given the much larger uh, and large group now should we how should we think about the scale of the REITs um, could we see some restructuring there so that they may become a more efficient offtake vehicle for your um, group so all good questions uh, lodging I mentioned uh, earlier is uh, interesting exciting uh, growth uh, platform uh, if you look at it uh, today it's hundred thousand units or or just shy of that uh, if you compete um, compare against the big players around the world I mean they are in the range of uh, between 500,000 to a million keys so there's a lot more work to be done to reach that global scale uh, and to build that level of a uh, global uh, competitiveness so that's something that the the team definitely needs to work on in terms of uh, REITs uh, yes, we have a lot more reads, a lot more uh, possibilities uh, with regards uh, how we uh, will rationalize, if any, is something that we will uh, uh, look at on an ongoing basis. I think the, the immediate uh, uh, question that will probably come to most of your mind would be uh, between the Escort uh, Residence Trust and the uh, Ascenders Hospitality Trust where obviously there are overlapping mandates of course uh, this is something that we will review and uh, we'll look at uh, 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 options that would make sense the best sense to the shareholders thank you Wilson uh, hi good morning it's uh, Wilson from Morgan Stanley <coughs> uh, just to follow up on that um, so in the near term, how would you look to manage the potential conflict of interest uh, across um, the hospitality mandates within the REIT space? You, you say you look at, you review several options. What kind of options would be, would come under that review? Uh, secondly, would be on your ROE and cost of equity. So there's this target to maintain that the ROE will be above the cost of equity. Uh, and with this uh, acquisition and the change in capital structure, the change in uh, earnings mix, uh, how do you see your cost of equity changing? Uh, I'll take the cost of equity question. So yeah, cost of equity will go up. Um, primarily, it's a mathematical output of higher leverage. So I think we will have to manage that very carefully. It, it does um, allow us to be more circumspect in the next um, 12 to 18 months as we consider new inorganic opportunities. Um, but it doesn't change the focus that we have in terms of driving towards a double-digit return on equity. I think that will still allow us to comfortably meet whatever cost of equity increase that we may temporarily have to um, deal with as a result of the, the increased gearing. Uh, with regards to the hospitality REITs, I mean, there are various options uh, available. One, of course, I mean, I'm just talking about the range of options. You could merge, you could go to the shareholders to deconflict the mandate, uh, or you could sell off the platform. I mean, these are all range of possibilities that we will review. But I don't think we are at this stage to, to uh, uh, announce or to look at because at the end of the day, any decision that we were to come to must uh, make sense for the business, must make sense for the shareholders. Um, just a few questions from me. First of all, on integration, um, what do you think would be a likely time frame in terms of you know integrating the two companies together, uh, having a firm strategy as to you know what the group, the combined group, would like to do? 
Um, and also, you know, in terms of unlocking values, what do you see in the near term? Um, and, you know, over the longer run, I mean, there's a small 4% dilution to NAV. How quickly do you think that can be realized through, you know, your unlocking of values? Integration committee uh, will be formed quite immediately. I mean, we'll start to look at the uh, integration issues from business, from HR organization, IT systems, finance systems. So the range of work uh, could take uh, a while. But at least on the people and organization side, I mean, uh, we should be ready uh, to finalize uh, before the completion. Uh, in terms of the business integration and systems integration, of course, it could take a while longer depending on the, uh, how, um, the, how, how we review the state of readiness between the, the two uh, companies. Um, with regards to the, on the question with regards to NAV uh, uh, dilution, yes, I think there's a slight NAV dilution if you were to issue shares at below uh, NAV. I mean, that's a given. Uh, we look at the uh, Acquisition, the uh, value of what how we what we are paying for, <coughs> the assets are really acquired at book, whether it's an uh, investment property or even the assets or the land that's uh, undergoing development. Uh, we believe that there's a lot of uh, value to be unlocked as long as we stay disciplined in terms of the development, in terms of the recycling. Uh, we should be able to unlock uh, value and drive the earnings and NAV growth. Yeah. No, and <clears throat> I think, Joy, the, we'd love to give you a number. We'd love to give you a timeline. But I, I have to leave you with the complementarity of the business. And I hope that was clear. If you look at the core market overlap, Right, the ability to fold uh, SUD into China and, and Singapore quickly, the complementarity of the commercial platform. I think all of these things are low-hanging fruit that we can, we can seize on quite quickly and figure out where these revenue synergies lie. And then on top of that, you've got the fund management platform, which is additive on day one um, and gives us more options, as Chikun says, about new REIT and private equity product, which we have already identified are key growth drivers for us. So if on these three things alone, I think you, we can, there's enough for us to get excited about and being able to uh, say that we can get you your ROE and NAV growth in relatively short order. And then of course, there's all the second order effects. Um, and just to clarify, the book value is as of a March book or the latest book? Or th they did a reval? The book value, is it a March uh, 18 book or is it reval book? The book value is March 18. Okay. Yes. Um, and could you share with us how much uh, goodwill you will be recorded, uh, recording on your balance sheet? The goodwill will change, of obviously, with the final uh, number. Um, so if you look at the book value as of March 18 and the six billion consideration, it's roughly about 800 million as it stands currently. Uh, and just last question from me. For, your, uh, for all the funds uh, mandate, is there a change of uh, control clause? in any of the Ascenders funds? What do you mean by change of control? So, is there, so in case of change of fund manager, um, would there be a false redemption? Or oh, anything? no, no, okay. there's none of that. All right, thank you. Can we have um, a friend in the media, uh, in the, from the media on the left? Hi, Joyce from Bloomberg. Hi, Chikun. You mentioned um, possibilities of new funds and REITs. Um, can we ask what, maybe where they'll come from? And we had um, understood that Ascender Singh Bridge was looking to do a US REIT. Is that still on track, or how do you think about that? Thanks. Uh, I mean, new funds and REITs are uh, ongoing business activities that uh, Capital N is uh, pursuing as well. Uh, we should, I mean, uh, actively be, be looking at and we, should ho we hope that we will be able to announce uh, some good news quite soon. Uh, once you put the two entities together, I mentioned uh, about the, the different markets and different asset classes. I think that creates a lot more optionality for us to even create more funds and REITs. And uh, specifically with regards to the, the question on the US uh, REIT portfolio, at this point in time, uh, the deal is not completed. 
So Ascenders uh, Simbridge, I mean, they are reviewing that, and that's something that uh, uh, you know they, they should they should review and see if it makes uh, sense. Uh, whether it makes sense to the business, whether it makes sense to the shareholder at this particular point in time. Yeah. In the middle, please. Hi, thank you, Mayuko from Nikkei. Um, can I ask um, how this deal um, came to uh, uh, well, uh, c came to this point? Um, is that uh, Capital Land approached um, as in a Singbridge, or uh, is that Temasek um, looking for uh, putting good good combination together? Um, uh, how how did it? Um, how was it given birth? Uh, uh, a deal of uh, this size, of course, uh, takes time to, to cook. Um, even under uh, the time under Ming Yen's leadership, we were always looking at options to how to strategically reposition the, the company for the future. Obviously, we look at uh, uh, many, many options, uh, both organic and inorganic opportunities. Of course, including uh, Ascenders, uh, uh, Simbridge as a as a possibility. So you know, so you w among ma many other uh, uh, options, this was being reviewed, and uh, we came to a willing buyer, willing seller kind of a uh, 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 outcome at the end of the day. It's it's a complex deal. It's a um, you know, uh, so that's why it took it took some time. Um, another question. Um. Are you getting the right f um, of the the rights of the name um, brand name of uh, Ascenders? So um, the REITs will remain um, the Ascenders name. Yes, uh, name? we uh, will take over the uh, name of Ascenders and Singbridge, and uh, we want to continue to keep the branding, uh, especially if uh, the branding is strong in the certain market or asset classes. We think that's the the uh, best way to run and to organize the combined entity. Derek, yeah. Hi, morning, Chicken. Derek from DBS. I'm just wondering whether you look at uh, ASB, right? Are you willing? What if the the company decide to go and do a big deal in the next six months? Will your price for the company change? I'm mean, just assuming Ascender Singbridge is also growing their AUM, they're buying logistics portfolio mm. say globally. Say for example, let's say in the next uh, six months, they do buy something big. Um, is it baked into the price really or will your price change? Uh, I think uh, now until uh, then, I mean, we if they're going to do any major acquisitions and if we are going to be the rightful owner, I think that's something that uh, we need to sit down and discuss. And uh, it's uh, too premature because uh, at this point in time, uh, what they are planning for at this point in time, they will go according to the budget as they have planned. And uh, if there's anything that we need to do, NAV adjustments, we will do it as per an every ad ordinary course of a uh, transaction. Yeah. Okay, I would like to take a couple of questions uh, from our viewers online. So this is from Lee Williard uh, from BNP Paribas. He asked, how would this acquisition help Capital Land perform in a much more difficult economic environment for the next few years? Uh, I, this particular uh, transaction is uh, strategic. It's complementary. In fact, it adds a, a diversified income stream from different asset classes across uh, different geography and I would say that uh, post this transaction it actually gives a uh, more uh, mixed capital land into a more global more diversified more balanced uh, in terms of uh, our portfolio both in geographical terms and both in the asset class terms so in my own sense is uh, it will actually make us more resilient in terms of cash flow and earnings Okay, one more question. Uh, this is from Wi-Fi, UBS. He asks, given the synergies have not been clearly identified, what is the rationale of acquiring ascenders at this point of time versus later? Uh, 
just to clarify, I mean, there are obvious synergies that uh, we have articulated, uh, whether it's from the asset class point of view, markets, fund management. The thing, uh, the point that we wanted to clarify is that we did not uh, compute the returns on the cost savings perspective. We are not expecting to derive cost savings okay, as a result of uh, this particular transaction. It may happen. It will be a bonus if it happens, but the entire financial pro forma that we have run to make this deal work was not uh, premised on cost savings. Okay. You can. Hi, uh, you come from CLSA. Uh, is there any changes to your targets besides the new gearing target that you mentioned? So ROE as well as capital recycling, is there any change to that previously uh, sort of soft target that you mentioned? Uh, secondly, on the point of uh, being a very diversified company, I think with this new entity, it's, it's a nightmare to model. Uh, <laughs> you have so many asset classes and, and across geographies that how would you streamline into different business segment going forward? Yeah. So as to make us easier to understand. Yeah. On the target, uh, post this uh, 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 as a transaction, we are confident that we should be able to still deliver returns above our cost of equity and should still work towards a, a double-digit uh, ROE on a sustainable basis. That's uh, our level of uh, confidence, especially given all the all the complementary skill sets and asset classes that I I, I believe would uh, add to the portfolio. Um, I I attempted earlier to explain, you know, uh, with regards to the potential question of complexity, by saying that if you take a step back uh, to look at capital, and really there are three income drivers. One is on the development side of the business, the second side is on the fund management, and the third side is on lodging. So even if you look at the different asset classes, whether it is in logistics, whether it's business park, whether it is in multi-family or so and so forth, at the end of the day, all the different asset classes in the different geography is really to help to drive the fund management uh, business. So different asset classes and different geography mainly give us the optionality. Yeah. So in terms of uh, helping to, to construct the, the model, uh, definitely we'll get uh, Grace and uh, Andrew to work more closely with the uh, analysts, uh, I mean to, to make life at least uh, easier in the modeling aspect. Pratik? Yeah, hi, uh, Pratik from HSBC. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, I know you shared some color on the DMEM split by assets under management. Could you give us some perspective uh, from, a, from an EBITDA sort of standpoint? The, the second one is on the payment for the funds management and the property management business, uh, I think you mentioned it's 15 to 16 times. Can I just clarify, is, is that on net income or at the EBIT or EBITDA level? And lastly, on the gearing, um, that's going to 0 0.72 times on uh, net debt to equity. Can you give us some sense, um, assuming uh, you know all the other transactions that you did in fourth quarter, what would that number have been on a pro forma basis um, and what the impact of this uh, transaction solely is? Sorry, bro, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat some of them. The second ans the s answer to your second question is uh, it's on a net income basis. <coughs> okay, net income. What was the third question again? The third question is really if you were to strip off the fourth quarter 2018 transactions that you had done like Pearl Bank, the US multifamily home, etc. If you were to strip those off, what would have been the gearing increase? Uh, it went from 0.51 to 0 0.72 times, but it, 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 it's got those transactions in there. Yeah, let, I'll come back to you on that pro forma number. In terms of the EBITDA mix, EM and DM, it's a bit early for us to be able to share that with you. So I ask you to bear with us. Uh, most of the information here is on an AUM level because 
the companies are organized differently, right? There are some that are consolidated, some that are not consolidated. So by trying to give you an EBITDA number, we may actually muddle the water even further. So what we have decided to do at the, this point in time is to focus at the AUM level, and I'm, by the time the circular comes out, we will be able to give you more color. But it's a very relevant question. But just to clarify, Andrew, I mean, the, the current number from what I recall is about 50-50. Yep. Would it significantly push up the DM uh, EBITDA component after I this? I don't want to comment because I honestly don't have a good sense. I mean, if you look at what Ascenders brings and where they are, I think you can sort of form a view that the uh, exposure to the DM is substantial. And it, uh, again, they don't consolidate AREIT, they don't consolidate AIT. So that's going to make EBITDA level calculations a bit trickier. So please bear with us. But uh, I think directionally, I think we're quite comfortable that this balance between EM and DM will be retained. Got it. Okay, thanks. Okay. The gearing pro forma um, on just the acquisition is 0.68. Can we pass the mic to our colleague in the front uh, middle section? Yes. Anita from the Business Times. Actually looking for a little bit more color on the deal. Um, how long did it take for you to talk and for this to come to fruition? And also curious, was there any single party that started the ball rolling? That's my first question. And my second one is, does the deal have any overlaps that you would much rather not have to deal with but had to take because it all came in a package? Thank you. Okay. So, as in, uh, I s on, the, on the first deal, essentially how long did it take? I, I s you see this more like a dating process. It's like uh, you're trying to find a, a girlfriend or somebody to marry, it does take time. Uh, and there must be a willing, uh, uh, a uh, willingness on both sides before a uh, marriage of this nature could uh, take place and obviously because it's a marriage uh, the courtship generally takes much longer than than the, I would say in a normal single type of uh, transaction so uh, in uh, short the the whole discussions has been going on for definitely more than six months yeah and uh, if you uh, ask me in terms of uh, areas where I would rather not have, I uh, actually am very impressed with um, the uh, entire portfolio of the Ascenders uh, Simbridge, uh, the quality of the assets, the quality of the team and the uh, strategy that they have worked out in terms of their growth. My view is that their business their team and the whole portfolio will be additive to um, Capital Land and will actually make us stronger, more diversified and really give us that optionality that Capital Land is, is looking for. Donald? Hi, uh, this is Donald from Merrill. A uh, couple of questions. So, um, Chiku, just to be clear, uh, is there any assets under ASB that you will consider as so a non-core? Would this all be considered core to Capital Land? Uh, if there's any non-core, uh, which are the ones and, and are we looking at divesting going forward? This is the first question. Se second is on the str uh, more details on the strategies for the REITs under Ascenders. So in particular, A REIT, is there any change, assuming that this deal goes through, is there any change in strategy that, that you envision uh, for A REIT, especially with the asset class, the geography going forward, or will be, as we see it now, status quo? That's the second question. Uh, and third is very quickly, how would the uh, resultant reporting line be? Uh, where would A read be report, uh, where would senders be reported into for Capital Land and uh, parked under which segment? Thanks. Are you speaking from a person perspective, personnel perspective, or from an organizational perspective? Okay, so from an organizational perspective, you can see it from that chart that we had on Grace, and we can flip that up. Yeah, this guy. So we've organized industrials, logistics, and business parks. So this is the traditional ASB business. Will be a separate BU from day one. But what we believe is, again, something that we can fold into fairly quickly. You see the SUD business under Singapore International and China. 
So because that business is very China-centric, we think that that can fold under um, uh, the CLC from day one quite quickly. The other area that I talked about was the commercial side of things. So again, we'll have to see and discuss with our Ascenders colleagues uh, when we form the integration committee, what is the best way we can put the commercial portfolio, where should we put that into to maximize the ability to realize these synergies. So it's still work in progress, obviously, um, but from an organization standpoint, we hope this gives you a bit more color around where it will sit day one. With regards to your other two questions, the first one on non-core assets, um, I don't uh, at this point in time uh, see that there are any uh, uh, assets that we would target. Uh, there may be certain markets uh, that we would um, together as a combined entity uh, look at, whether uh, given the new and larger uh, focus and uh, markets and uh, asset classes that we have, whether we have enough uh, capital to really build those markets into uh, uh, to deploy capital in a meaningful way, so that would be my my uh, response to your initial to, to your first question uh, on uh, a read. Um, uh, a read is done well as the largest read, uh, biggest read in Singapore, trading at a significant premium to to NAV. So I, I believe that uh, this particular read uh, give us um, a lot of uh, options to consider even uh, uh, doing much more aggressively in terms of uh, setting up funds to support um, subsequent, uh, uh, you know, in the subsequent bulking up of uh, A-REIT. So my own view is uh, A-REIT has a tremendous uh, uh, potential. Yeah. I'm going to take two more questions uh, from our online viewers. Uh, from Arun Kapoor, Ariana Management, what is your long-term plan in India? Does the current size of Ascenders India meet your Indian uh, India ambition for the future? Uh, Cap Capital Land was uh, tried to uh, uh, invest in India for some time. I mean, the, to, to be fair, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, what we have done, because uh, compared to what Ascenders uh, Singbridge has done, Ascenders uh, Singbridge has uh, chosen a good asset class, have done well, vertically integrated. Uh, we like India uh, because of the tremendous size of the market. I think there are tremendous uh, opportunities for us to deepen our capital and to grow in this particular space. We have not uh, made a decision in terms of uh, how much capital to allocate to each of the markets at this point in time. But uh, my own sense is India offers uh, uh, a lot more opportunities for growth. Okay, another question from uh, Mr. David Fun from LaSalle. He asked, based on a comment uh, that the pillars will be development, fund management, and lodging, uh, will most IPs be going to fund management rather than own on balance sheet? Uh, that's uh, typically the strategy or the investment approach for, for capital land. Uh, for I mean whether it's held in private equity funds or through JV structures or through the REITs, that have always been the way in which we look at the the uh, investment properties. Sometimes, uh, depending on cycle, we may invest, uh, wait for the cycle before we enjoy the rental upside before we recycle, and uh, that means that we may put more out, more of our balance sheet to work. But as much as possible, we want to make use uh, leverage on terms of our of our private equity funds uh, platform to hold many of these assets. Okay, I think, yes, our colleague on, uh, on the left. Thank you. Um, Radna from Reuters. So with this deal, you're in REITs across several sectors. So I just wanted to get your general view on the Singapore REIT sector. Which segments are you particularly optimistic about? Which ones not so much? We like all of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's helpful to remind ourselves why REITs are useful <coughs> and why they play a, a major role in uh, capital markets. 
They are very uh, through the cycle uh, creatures. They are very resilient. They give a lot of recurring income. In this type of environment, um, that type, these types of attributes become particularly attractive to investors. So what I think we offer is we have the full platform, right? We have the full suite of sectors and investors can then decide if they prefer retail, for example, right now, then they can, we've got three retail REITs that they can invest in. If they like the office sector, we've got an office REIT and so on and so forth. So um, what I think is absolutely critical though is you have to have REITs that are of scale. You have to have REITs that demonstrate the ability to grow DPU over time for unit holders. And once you're able to do that, then your unit holders will stay with you through the cycle because they trust that management knows what they're doing, they can recycle, they can undertake AEI at the right times, and these are all very, very important for REIT unit holders. So we believe that the capital land stable of REITs, including the ASB stable, which also have demonstrated very, very good track records, will, will become very, very um, compelling for REIT unit holders, regardless of the sector that you're particularly interested in. Hope that answers your question. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Michael. Um, hi, it's Michael from UBS. Uh, Ascender Singh Bridge has, coven, has several ongoing projects at the moment. Can you just give us a sense of the CAPEX needs, um, their CAPEX needs, say over the next 12 months or maybe 24 months? Thank you. We haven't shared this number. Um, it is what I can tell you is that their committed capex for the business, the platform as a whole, has been factored into my our calculations for the deleveraging that uh, will have to account for whatever um, capex we need to set aside for both Capital Land and ASB. So I think at the right time we can share that with you, but perhaps to give you comfort that. Um, the daily averaging plan again fully accounts for this. <coughs> Sorry, it can't be more specific. I'll take the last question from Tan Xuan in the middle. Hi, this is Tan Xuan from CLSA. Uh, I have one question on CCT specifically. Um, will the, US, the Korea office, US office, and suburban office fit into CCT's? Um, current mandate and also is that part of your deleveraging plan as well? I, I, don't, I don't think we should speak on behalf of the CCT management on the board uh, but uh, it is uh, definitely a, a possible portfolio that the CCT's uh, management and the board could look at. <coughs> Actually we have time for one last question, Bloomberg. Hi, um, just as your major shareholder, how instrumental was Tomasic in driving this deal also? And second question, I mean, Chikun, you've been in their role for four months, um, and it's this is your first mega deal. I mean, can we get a sense of your vision for this enlarged group and how, how much further you want to grow the company? Thanks. Uh, in terms of uh, the negotiation with uh, Tomasic, I mean, even though they are major shareholder, uh, we have to negotiate this deal on the, what we think make commercial sense because we are a listed entity. We have responsibility to our all our other shareholders. So that's why uh, the negotiations. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, I would say not not easy, not easy. But I think we reach an outcome that uh, the management feel that it is uh, good for the business, good for the, uh, the people, and I think will help to position Capital Land in terms of its uh, transformational journey. Uh, capital Land of the future, I mean, uh, um, Andrew uh, used a, a short form of saying Capital Land 3.0. What we, I mean, the first, there's a Capital Land 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, if you, uh, a good way of saying is uh, 1.0 maybe it's a regionalization where really Singapore from Singapore you move out to become China and parts of uh, Southeast Asia 2.0 there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of consolidation there's a lot of strengthening of our uh, back our back end and uh, uh, laying the foundation for future growth and 3.0 I would say it's a global ambition 
one that is really going to build uh, uh, asset uh, classes, uh, uh, build capital into a range of uh, different asset classes, different markets, to give us that optionality to truly become a global real estate player. And I think that's a very good concluding remark. Uh, for this briefing. Thank you all for taking time to be here. And I also want to uh, say a few words to our online viewers. We have a very strong turnout today. And I'm sure many of uh, uh, those who tune in are our investors. I just want to mention that uh, once the circula circular is out, we will be uh, going on our roadshow. Please feel free to reach out to the IR team uh, if you have any questions. And uh, we will uh, hope to meet you sometime uh, before the EGM. Okay, and uh, there is food outside. You know, please feel free to uh, stay around. The senior management will be around uh, for some mingling. Thank you, everyone.